This episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by Jacob Elliott and the rest of my Patreon supporters who help make this show happen by donating a dollar or two each week. Jake, I loved watching you crush back in the youth comps, and now I get to commentate while you were in podiums in open. I love having you in the scene, and it means a lot to have your support. Thanks a lot, man. Not a lot of 25-year-olds have opened up a modern climbing gym, let alone in a town far from home. But Lauren Watson did, and she happened to set up shop in Squamish, one of North America's premier climbing destinations. I have never had a desire to open a gym, so her drive, her follow-through, and her success are all things that are really foreign to me, and the fact that we're contemporaries makes her a really interesting person for me to look into. I guess I wanted to know if we had severely different backgrounds or experiences that made her more optimistic about business ownership. So while this interview starts off with some deep background, her childhood, her parents, her brothers, we end up talking through the classic startup story. Getting a loan when all you own is an old Volvo and whatever's inside it, trying to make your gym satisfy the desires of every damn climber in town, and showing up to a wall builder's house in tears in the middle of the night. You know, the normal stuff. I love Lauren's story. And I hope you'll take the time to listen. All right, and uh, right now I've got Lauren Watson. She's the owner and director of the Ground Up Climbing Center in Squamish on the line over Skype. Uh, Lauren, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm I'm doing great. I'm really glad we finally kind of get a chance to talk about this stuff. I know we started working in climbing roughly around the same time, but in different neighborhoods, and and uh, and then I kind of you know through friends followed you going across the country, starting up a gym out there. And uh, and that's something I would always be <laughs> way too scared to do. So uh, this is kind of an interesting thing for me to talk about. I'm glad we can chat for a bit. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, Yeah, it'll be interesting to chat for sure. So we'll get into the, the, the nitty gritty gym stuff eventually because that's what, you know, we all live for. But uh, I want to talk about just you for a bit and, and how you started out and how you got into all this stuff. And so... I, I want to know, like, what kind of kid you were um, back in the day. You were telling me you grew up uh, kind of in York and in, in Toronto, like Eglinton area. Um, what were you like as a as a little girl? Um, I was, I don't know. I guess I was kind of weird. Um, I, I think, like, one of the, I don't know. I, I was, I think I was a normal kid to start out. Uh, I have three older brothers. Um. I did uh, like gymnastics and soccer and um, when I was 11, a French teacher, I wanted to unicycle and she told me, she laughed at me and said that it wasn't. <laughs> so I showed her and I bought a unicycle and joined the Toronto Trials team and unicycling club for unicycling and that's probably where I got a bit weirder. Um, and then yeah, went to arts high school uh, yeah I, I don't know I don't know what do you want to know <laughs> <laughs> which which arts high school did you go to I went to Cardinal Carter it's, okay uh, cool yeah it's up at Shepherd and Young yeah I I did some time at Humber for music so I remember a few people came from uh from there um, oh, cool. if yeah. I remember properly okay so at 11 you got into unicycling what kind of parents would allow their kid to to start doing that in sixth or seventh grade yeah, I think pretty cool parents. Um, <laughs> they, yeah, like like I said, there's I have three older brothers as well, so it was a it was a big family. But um, yeah, they just kind of they're really encouraging. If I like, I bought it myself and just wanted to learn how to unicycle. I think they probably kind of found it funny that uh, that I was into it, and like I I like jumped on it. We were unicycling every single day. I was going up and down like Eglinton Avenue unicycling. Um, we were yelling at people on bikes, like, lose a wheel, freak. Um, and, uh, yeah, I had a couple of friends who did it too in the neighborhood and that, yeah, that was a, that was definitely a defining part of my youth. That's a bit different. What were your brothers like? Like how, what's the age gap between all you guys? Um, so David is six years older than, no, whoa, sorry. Uh, David is three and a half years older than me and then Tim is six years older than me and then Mike is 10 years older than me. Oh wow so there's like a, a really big span between you guys. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. How much of an influence did they have on on like how you turned out? Did you like learn from their mistakes or did you idolize them in a lot of ways? Um, I think both for sure. Um, yeah, I I bet they they did influence me quite a lot. It's hard to say, right? You haven't I haven't lived anyone else's childhood, so I don't really know how it's different than um, not having three older brothers. But um, I definitely did a lot of the same stuff as what they did. Uh, like I was. Like, I think I got into soccer and into hockey because of them. Um, unicycling, yeah, once again, was a little bit different, but it was still um, along those, like, athletic lines of trying to get into sports and uh, do what you could do. I don't – yeah, that's a hard question. Sorry. I don't know how to answer it. I think it's, it is a little bit weird asking people our age to, like, reflect on childhood because it was almost, you know, just yesterday in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um uh- Yeah, I'd say like how they turn, like, I think right now, I think it is easier to look back now on things that probably did influence me. Like um, one of my brothers uh, now is in like the music industry and is um, a manager there and he's really successful with that. And then uh, another one of my brothers is in financial, the financial system, like downtown Toronto. And then my other brother actually just opened a brewery in Toronto, eastbound. So he's got like the entrepreneur thing going on too, which I think I guess it runs in all of us. That's cool. What uh, what did your parents do, or what are they still doing? Um, my my dad's a doctor. He's an obstetrician uh, and a GP, and he also teaches at U of T. And then my mom is a family therapist and teaches with him at U of T, uh, the family medicine program. Um, so. Yeah, none of none of their kids got master's degrees or went into medicine, so maybe maybe a little disappointing on that side. But I think they're still really proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, did you feel any pressure in like high school to kind of follow those lines? Uh, more as a joke than anything. Like, I yeah, I know that my dad would absolutely love to have one of his kids in medicine, and I was kind of the last chance at that because uh, all of the others went in other directions. Um, but once again, being in an arts high school and um, already showing very strong signs of uh, not being great at math or science probably kind of crushed those dreams on their own. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, then I guess the next obvious question is how did you find climbing, first of all? Uh, originally, I definitely say that I found it kind of around like 11 or 12. I, I went to camp, a summer camp. I think from the gymnastics background, I um, I just really liked it and I was good at it. And when you're a kid and you're good at something, I think that's a natural draw to liking it quite a lot. Um, I, was, I was at a camp that actually allowed me, the instructor um, let me progress through all the levels and was kind of making up levels for me, um, which was also really inspiring and kind of kept me uh, motivated with it. Um, and then... Yeah, by the by the time I was leaving camp after when I was like twelve or thirteen, I had already used an ATC and I had already learned how to repel and kind of felt like I had this really cool skill set that no one else had. So um, I twisted the arm of all my awesome unicycling friends to come to <laughs> rock races with me uh, as often as I could possibly convince them. So. I I would probably go about once a month. My dad learned how to belay, and so he would go with me as well. Um, And I just kind of kept it up, like, pretty, like, when you look at some of the kids these days, really casually, but at the time, it was like, I was trying to go whenever I could, and usually it ended up being around once a month. Okay, cool. And then eventually, you started doing a little bit of work in climbing. Was that when you got into your, into your, like, late teens or your 20s? Um, yeah, like, I, I think it really took off at Guelph, uh, and the university, like at the on-campus gym at Guelph, um, it was like $30 for a semester and included your rentals. And so that was a pretty sweet deal as a student, yeah. uh, it's a really cool community, like a basement climbing gym, two squash courts, um, all made by really inspiring people, um, and like it's just a very tight community. So it ended up being kind of my home for university. Uh, and yeah, I taught climbing there, I taught beginner courses, uh, and ended up being asked to be the president of it in my last year, which was super surprising to me, but I 
was really excited to take it on with my friend Colin. We were both co-presidents there. Nice. Um, so after university, tell me, like, this is kind of the time when everybody starts falling apart and dreams we had don't quite work out and we start kind of yeah. doubting who we are and stuff. Um, I'm guessing you finished up your time at Guelph. What happened then? Um, so on the last exam, the day of the last exam, I jumped in a car with a friend and we drove uh, south. We had a, like a bunch of that same Guelph crew had already taken off because they their exams had finished earlier. They'd already finished school. Um, so there was a bunch of us kind of convoying uh, through the states climbing. And I think I think we had like the really naive goal of thinking we were incredible rock climbers because we were so good in the campus gym at Guelph and we were going to go take over the world. Um, so then we went and we visited Colorado and did my first, uh, like followed up my first trad granite uh, multi-pitch and wrote in my journal that I would never ever touch granite or trad or multi-pitching again. Um, <laughs> where, where was that specifically? That was in uh, that was in Rocky Mountain National Park. It was um, the Pear Buttress. It was a five eight. It had crack and chimneys and uh, slab, and I had no idea what was going on. And it left it left a strong impression, I guess. Yeah. Oh, totally. It was pretty, <laughs> pretty strong. So we we started there, and then we went down to Vegas, and we went to Yosemite next, and then to Smith Rock, and then to Squamish. And then I had already signed up for uh, a summer job in Canmore as a raft guide, like a, a whitewater rafting guide. So that's where the trip ended. Okay, cool. Uh, how long did you stay out west before you came back to Ontario? Uh, so I stayed out for that summer um, rafting and then came back to Ontario because uh, I was out of money and needed to stay at my parents' house. And um, then I started working at Boulders in Toronto. And how long were you there? What kind of stuff were you doing? Uh, I I was doing front desk for Andrew and then also got to start working on the youth programs and I uh, was coaching the pre-competitive team there and doing a little bit of route setting, kind of helping out wherever he needed. Okay, so um, it's like a common thing for a lot of climbers to, you know, fill that kind of role and at the same time be dreaming about climbing outside or be thinking about what's next. Um, so for you at this point, were you at the stage where you were wanting to open a gym now that you were spending more time working in a commercial one or, you know, what was your, you know, what was your North star at, at this point? Um, so I think the, my North star was kind of gone when I was in Ontario, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, the main drives were whitewater rafting. I still wanted to be a guide, um, and I still wanted to ideally move to like Uganda and be a whitewater raft guide. And climbing was helping me train for that. And uh, I was also starting to get more into journalism. I had written some articles for kayaking magazines and taken some photos for them. And I was starting to get into the climbing scene as well for that. Um, and so while I was in Ontario, I was loving the climbing community and sticking with it and kind of always thought it would be really cool to open a climbing gym, but didn't have kind of figured I'd do it maybe a little bit later in life, like after doing other things for quite a while. But yeah. Okay, things. cool. So uh, I've been reading through your blog and kind of trying to get to know your, you know, yourself in this time before you opened up uh, the ground up climbing center. And so the way I understand the timeline is you went back down to the States and did a lot of climbing and just kind of got lost for a while, but you were heading to Squamish. And I wanted to know if, if uh, you were heading to Squamish because you wanted to settle there and maybe open a gym or did it just happen to be where you ended up? Uh, I was definitely headed to Squamish. That was the end goal, but it wasn't to open a gym. Um, the, the things in my mind when I was heading to Squamish, I had already applied for Masters of Journalism. So I, I was kind of headed to Squamish, A, because I just really wanted to climb and get back because I found it such a magical place. Um, and then I was also hoping to get into UBC for the Masters of Journalism. Um, and I figured that I, like starting a life out west would work for that. And... As I, as I was coming out west, I was I met up with uh, the folks from Dirtbag Diaries in Seattle, 
and I was trying to find out more about kind of where where the journalism I was interested in was heading. Uh, and that, to be honest, was why I came to Squamish. I had nothing to do with opening a climbing gym whatsoever. Okay. What, what kind of journalism were you interested in? Uh, like, just for the most part, I was, I was looking at going to school for something a little bit heavier, like more investigative journalism. But I was trying to find a way of, like, I really enjoyed photography and I could make quite a bit of money off of photos and photos for magazines and stuff like that. And that was working, but being like a written journalist was much harder. So I was looking into the podcast side of things. I really liked the stories that Dirtbag Diaries was coming out with. I was, I was kind of just like dabbling, trying to figure out where I would fit in if I was to follow a career there. Um, it was a little bit broad. Yeah. Okay. So you get to Squamish and it seems like that's not how things turn out. Did you end up starting that master's uh, or did you change direction pretty quick? So I was helping and teaching climbing with Squamish rock guides all summer and enrolled in a bunch of like in a bunch of UBC uh, classes and courses to see if I could get my grades up, uh, which I did, which was awesome. Um, and so that fall, I was still pretty focused on going to journalism school. And then that's when I kind of started looking around and being like, this is, this is crazy. Why can't we, like, I can't bring any new climbers to the co-op in town and kids don't have a place to climb here. And like, that was a huge part of my life in Toronto. And I loved that. And I was like, just so inspired by everything that uh, McBurney did with boulders and remembering like how much I loved running the climbing gym at Guelph and I guess I, I started kind of like running my mouth off uh especially at work I worked at the brew pub in town and so I kind of talked about like why isn't there a climbing gym here blah blah blah, blah. and everyone like about 10 people said that they had tried to build one and it was impossible and it wasn't it wasn't worth it and it was too small of a town and like etc cetera, etc cetera. uh and then my brother visited the financial one and he got really he got me all psyched up on um, looking into it a bit more. So I applied for my master's, um, on the 15th of January in 2013. And then I think I like went down there threw the stuff in the mail, came back home and then called McBurney and said, asked him if I was crazy for thinking about opening a climbing gym. And after talking to him for a while about it, uh, he convinced me I wasn't crazy. Uh, and then I called my brother again, and he helped me figure out how to write a cash flow uh, Excel sheet. And then I kind of spent the next three months kind of biding my time to figure out if I was going to get into the master's or not this time and writing a business plan. Cool. I think this is a good time to talk about Squamish itself and like the kind of climbing community that's there. I think for anybody listening, especially if you're outside of Canada, uh, Squamish might be the only place you've heard of in, in Canada in regards to like climbing areas. So it's, it's obviously um, uh, a big deal in the Canadian climbing community. But could you flesh out a bit more um, the dynamics of the community, both the outdoor and the indoor community in Squamish at the time? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Squamish is a really interesting climbing community because, first of all, it's it's like a very close, tight community, and you meet everyone very quickly, um, and everyone is incredibly humble. Um, and it might sound weird, but coming from Ontario, that like, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with Ontario. I'm just saying that I think what I thought of myself as a climber, I like identified as a climber, as an outdoor person, and I came to Squamish, and everyone you meet is so chill, and then you find out that you're talking to like, you're, t you're talking to Tyson Braun, who's done all these incredible first ascents, or you're talking to, to like Ben, or you're talking to, you're talking to all these people or climbing with them in the co-op or like seeing them realize how accomplished everybody is around you. And it's pretty humbling when you figure it out and pretty cool to have like such a, a very like inclusive small community of climbers who don't really care how hard you climb at all. Um, and they are just all very passionate about climbing. That's kind of the first, the very first, and it like maintain that as the, the vibe that I get from Squamish climbing. 
Okay, cool. Now, at the same time, you were an outsider in most regards, um, and there was an established scene there. There was this other gym, and and well, when I say gym, you know, uh, like a pretty old school bouldering co op. I have never been there, so I don't want to describe it because I have no experience with it. Um, but there was there was like an established community there, and when you uh, kind of came out and said, "I'm going to go for this gym thing." Did that fit in with how everybody, you know, thought of Squamish or did you run into some opposition from from the existing community? Uh, I was I was trying to be pretty careful when I started thinking about actually opening a gym, not to say anything to anyone because I two things were going on. First of all, I'd already fallen in love with the co-op, which is the um, the pre-existing uh, climbing indoor climbing community in Squamish. And I was helping out there a lot. And so I was kind of like conflicted about the idea of actually opening a gym anyways. Uh, and when it did come out, the initial reaction was definitely negative, <laughs> um, which uh, sucked, but I get it completely. It's like, I was pretty new to the community and uh, uh, the first reaction that I got, cause I was on the board of directors for the co-op. Um, so I was asked to step down. Uh, and then asked to stay on again and then kind of like kept on, was in like a really strange place for that first um, year of working. It took three years to open the gym. So the first year it was kind of under wraps, but some people knew. And every time someone new found out, I got a little bit of a backlash from it. Um, and then it kind of calmed down. And even leading up to, like, it, definitely in the last year before the gym opened, there was a lot of people who were really excited about it opening and really supportive. Um, and, like, yeah, incredible, like, community support came out in that last year. But the two prior years, like, from 2013 to the beginning of, uh, the beginning of 2013 to the beginning of 2015, it was definitely more of, uh, like, people just didn't know who I was. And I think they were worried about who was trying to take over their climbing community and, that's pretty fair if you look at it from like the way I see it. Um, nobody like, yeah, I was completely new to the scene and I was jumping in and trying to uh, say that I was going to do something that was threatening the co-op first of all, and potentially uh, like there's not too much room in Squamish for that many climbing gyms. So opening a climbing gym means that what you, whatever I make is the thing that they're stuck with. Um, which is a, a lot of pressure, but also be just like very scary for people who don't know the person who's trying to do that. How did you reconcile that yourself? As you, you know, it was the, uh, sorry, the co-op is, is it the grand wall bouldering co-op. Is that the full name of it? Yep. Okay, yeah. cool. So this place meant a lot to you. And at the same time, you were going to make this decision, build this business that, you know, uh, posed a real risk to that thing. So in yourself, you know, that's, that's a lot of conflict. How did you manage that within yourself? Oh, it sucked. Um, I don't really know. I don't have a good answer for that one. I, I kind of, I was building the gym. The reasons I was building the gym are because I really wanted to create that space for the youth programs that I had seen in action and for that opportunity. And also to get all of my beginner friends into climbing. And then also it was kind of like this moment where you're, you're looking at that opportunity of, okay, I'm, I'm either going to have to leave Squamish because I don't have a viable career here. And even becoming a rock guide isn't, there's a lot of rock guides around and that's kind <laughs> of, yeah, it wasn't like, and it wasn't a full year job. And so it was like, either I'm going to have to leave, which I've now fallen completely in love with this place or I'm gonna to have to find a way to give myself a permanent job here. And so there was kind of that like survival side of it where I was like, well, I need to make myself a job. Um, and then there was also just not really thinking, trying to like rephrase it in terms of not feeling like I was in competition with the co-op, hopefully. And like, I guess that was kind of naive as well, but like kind of just hoping that there was gonna be space for both and that it wasn't gonna be we were going to be offering completely different things and uh, be able to balance it. And just to set a barometer for this, like how old were you at the time when you were making these decisions? I was 
All right. Um, so okay, right. <laughs> yeah. you you briefly talked about when you started thinking about doing this that you reached out to your brother who has a background in in financial services and then also yeah. to Andrew McBurney who you worked for in Toronto at Boulders. Um, those are really important resources to have if you if you want to do this kind of thing. And I know not everybody has access to uh, to those kind of uh, people with that experience. But once you started taking these first initial steps, um, I kind of know that your team really expanded and you had a, a really big supportive team. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the roles that you realized you needed to fill if you wanted to make this project happen? Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Like the the initial, so there were, yeah, there's, there was a number of hurdles, like definitely having those mentors and like my brother, I think one night and was talking about uh, how I was really unsure. I was like, oh, I don't want like a, I still want to like run around the world and like write stories and do um, like go the journalism path really badly. And I think that that's my path. But then like opening a business is totally different. And it's going to like attach me to one place for so long. And I'm not sure that's what I want to do. And he kind of just said, just keep doing it till it doesn't make sense. And then when it doesn't make sense, stop doing it. Um, and it never really stopped making sense. So that was really cool. Um, and then I went to try and figure out how to finance a climbing gym um, as someone who had the uh, the assets being a Volvo from 1997 <laughs> and a big camera and a trad rack. And so um, I kind of got... Uh, laughed at a little bit. I definitely got laughed at. I like even the like the community financing establishments here. When I walked in and said I wanted to build a climbing gym, they did laugh at me and told me that I was like the tenth person to come in and say that, and that it was never going to happen, especially if I didn't have funding, which I didn't. Uh, I realized I needed to focus more on the business plan, so I quit um, the Zephyr Cafe. At, at the time, I was working at Squamish Rock Guides the Zephyr Cafe and the uh, House Sound Brew Pub. Um, so I quit Zephyr and it happened to be the day that Adrian uh, bought Zephyr uh, and took over. So he was kind of upset that one of his staff was leaving on the first day he bought the place. Uh, but it turns out that he went to Guelph and he used to climb in the gym that I ran. Um, so he was really supportive and he immediately said like, Hey, do you need any help or money? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. I need both those things. Please, please come join my team. So he was he was already an entrepreneur. He was already really into business. And he also had the assets to back a really big bank loan. So um, that was that was the first step. Um, in the like uh, as the, after we had already signed the lease for the building and the building was being built, uh, the bank actually decided that we were too risky and took the loan away, which oh, was, shit. yeah. So this was like the building was already being built. We'd already signed contracts with Vertical Solutions and we lost our loan. So, so uh, we played every card that we possibly could and managed to convince another bank to pick up our loan. Um, and then we still realized with the dollar, the dollar had shifted. So it could no longer be just me and Adrian. We needed like, uh, hundreds of thousands of more dollars we didn't know what to do so we're kind of bargaining for people who are willing to put in sweat equity for jobs that we needed to get done before the gym opened and people who really wanted a piece of something like something that's so community-based and so cool and squamish and we ended up with this like after going through a lot of people and a lot of negotiations with different people we ended up with this amazing crew of the five of us um jess is incredible at management and uh, event planning. And Tyson has an incredible eye for design and had built the grotto in Guelph and uh, the co-op in Squamish and uh, incredibly accomplished climber as well. And then Jeff um, is an accountant, which is really freaking helpful. And he came on and joined the team. So it ended up with this crew that I think we're all pretty different. Uh, and I think that's why it will work in the long run is because we bring a lot of different things to the table. That's really cool that that all worked out. Yeah, uh, really, really lucky. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, yeah. 
Well, let's talk about the, you know, the gym and the building. You guys did a custom build uh, structure. Um, as you were getting into the design, what were you thinking about? Like, I don't know the population of Squamish, but in terms of size, in terms of what kind of walls you wanted to put in, uh, like, how, how did you start to conceptualize what ground up would look like? Uh, so when I may or may not have met you at the CWA, uh, <laughs> I was on a road trip. And so I, I visited within like those four months, I visited about 50 gyms and then, um, also was calling and getting numbers from any gym that would give them to me. So, um, like, uh, talking to some small, like look, asking as much as I could from dog tooth, which is the gym that's in, uh, golden BC, and the gym in Jackson Hole enclosure at the time, and visiting them and visiting the little gym in uh, in Estes Park in Colorado, and going all around Boulder and visiting all those gyms and like the ones in Salt Lake and the ones in um, in Oregon uh, in Bend and as many basically just went to every gym that I could and took pictures and made notes on what was working and what wasn't working. And then I had Tyson as well, who is invaluable for figuring out flow of space and uh, having a lot of experience with wall angles and different types of climbing walls. Um, so the design process basically took up a lot of just like taking as much information from as many different places. And then for the community size, we when the gym was being built, we had um, 17,500 people, 17,531 people or something like that which by all measures is like not uh, the size of a community you want to build a climbing gym in. Uh, but using using the examples of smaller communities in mountain towns and figuring out like Jackson Hole was a really good, um, like Andy Lackman who runs uh, the software as well. He was really, really helpful for helping with, like he just gave, I think he emailed me and said it's a bad idea because, and gave me a list of reasons and I used those to figure out how to make it work. Um, and that was kind of the same thing from a lot of the other small towns where they say it's a bad idea because then I was like, okay, so if I just focus on not, on like making sure that we balance these needs with these needs and like that might be one of the problems that happened there and maybe this is how this went down. And so we ended up with a model of the gym and we, we ended up actually in, once again, like asking for an extra bay before it got built so that it was 7,000 square feet on the ground floor and then we have a 3,000 foot mezzanine. So 10,000 feet altogether of floor space, um, which is a lot bigger than 20,000 people can support. <laughs> You ended up going with vertical solutions, and that's probably the the biggest decision that uh, a new gym has to make. So, why did you uh, decide to go with uh, the the three D curves and the VS guys? Uh, a number of reasons. First of all, uh, the the original boulders was um, like the boulders that's at Dupont yeah. is vertical solutions as well, and so. Um, I really loved those walls and I loved setting on them and I loved everything about them. And then Tyson actually also um, really liked the Vertical Solutions product because of his experience uh, down, he's, he'd been down to the front in Salt Lake City. Oh yeah. And really loved those walls and just like the aesthetic of it, but also just the, like the fact that it's wood, the fact that the the curves are very beautiful, but even without the curves, just the the way that they design walls is really beautiful. And so talking to a number of different um, climbing gym companies, and then we also flew down to Salt Lake and hung out with those guys for a weekend. And we met them at the C one of the CWAs as well. And first of all, they're all really uh, amazing human beings. And it feels like you're working with people when you're working with them, which might sound funny, but now <laughs> after a couple of years, it's kind of rare. It's kind of like... Yeah, it's 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 cool to work with people who um, also see you as a person and see you as um, like see your goals and like I don't know your failings as well. Like I, I had no idea what the heck was going on, and they definitely had patience for me with that. Um, it was just really easy to work with them. So yeah, it was it was a really cool experience and. Uh, things things happened like when when we ran out of money and I was suddenly I was like trying to figure out how. Like when the dollar changed and all this stuff went down, I 
drove down in kind of like a frenzy, just like an insanity, like escape in my car kind of thing. And my car broke down in, uh, in Oregon and died and I had to hitchhike and I showed up like crying at midnight to like the sales rep of Vertical Solution, Chad's house. And he's like, here's a beer and just like let me crash on his couch. And they let me stay at the gym and like hang out all weekend. And that's, that was like, you know that you're working with good people when that's the kind of business relationship you have is people who are willing to take you in under <laughs> circumstances. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, they're like, just like really good humans to work with. And like, we went back and forth for about six months on the design and like Tyson had his ideas that he really wanted in there. I had my ideas and, uh, and then they, they didn't just give us what we wanted. They also put a lot of what they knew in their knowledge of the industry and what was going to work long term in. And we compromised and it was the, it was like a really, it was a really good process to go through. Yeah. It's really cool. I, I got to visit, um, a year and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, like um, spring of 2016, we popped in just kind of halfway between Canadian Nationals and the Vail World Cup. And oh, cool. uh, yeah, I was I was really impressed mostly on on how much space you left available. Uh, I, you know, we came in, in the middle of the day. There was nobody else there. It was just, you know, that you probably just opened uh, for the day. Um, but especially in a small market where I feel like a lot of people would try and get as much into the smallest possible space. Uh, it felt really good in there. I, I really liked being in that space. I think you guys made some really good decisions. Um, on the flip side, though, now that you've lived with that gym for a while, um, when you reflect back on those decisions you made and the walls you have now, are there any changes you wish you uh, had made to uh, to the walls? Uh, no, like, obviously, like, especially right now, like winter in Squamish, it feels really small. And it feels like we could, we could use a lot of different things. But um, I, I think that no matter how you build the wall, there's always, it, I think it will always feel small. And I think it probably always feels small. In, just because you can't have everything. So I'm pretty happy with how it worked out. And uh, like, we're, we're trying to make it better. We're trying to see where we can add stuff without losing that um, open feeling that you get. Because I think it's also important, uh, as much as like wall space is important, creating like a very cavernous climbing gym also just creates a very dusty, um, kind of horrible environment to be in for long periods of time. <laughs> so uh, if you're if you're going to be in a really rainy, dank place all winter, it's kind of nice to walk into a really big, open, bright room and climb. So. Yeah. Um, we, we're going to keep it that way. And I don't, yeah, I don't really think that there's anything, uh, no, nothing that I would really change in particular. Cool. There's stuff I'd like to add, but not nothing that I would change from what, what we opened with. Cool. Uh, so you guys have been up and running for a couple of years now. And in terms of the expectations you had when you started getting into this process, um, how does the reality compare to the the expectation or the dreams you had when you were just starting to put this thing together? Uh, I think, yeah, I think like it's a lot of hard work. And uh, whenever I say that, people are like, oh, you should have known that. And I'm like, oh, I did. But um, I also, I kind of thought it would be a little bit different. I didn't think, to be honest, that it would be so big. Like I, uh, which, yes, that does sound naive, but I think that naivety is very necessary for being a good entrepreneur. Um, it was, I thought that when we opened that I would be running this show, um, like much, to be honest, much like, uh, like, uh, boulders started out boulders at DuPont was, and it was like mostly McBee and he had a few staff kind of like me. And so I was like, okay, that's kind of how it's going to go. I'm going to open and, uh, it's going to be very small. And it immediately, like the community just came out and like kind of threw down and, uh, so I found myself the one big oversight that all of my business partners kept on asking, like, how many staff are you going to hire? I was like, oh, not many. How many staff are you going to hire? Oh, just like a couple. And then we opened and it was it was kind of like, who can work full time? Who wants to be a manager? Like, just like <laughs> everything had got thrown out of proportion really fast. And I found myself reading a lot of management books and trying to, like, figure out how I like who I wanted to be within that role and that's that was a lot of self-discovery and trying to figure out how to how to manage 
that aspect of a business of like employees and what is HR anyways and how do you like how do you make this work and how do you how do you give people what they want how do you like how we have to make up the jobs because we don't have descriptions for all these positions that we're about to hire for and like trying to figure that stuff out um, was definitely the toughest most unexpected part about opening it and that was because it was like we ended up having a lot of a really big membership and we had a lot of people who wanted to come in a lot and it was way bigger than we could have anticipated from any of the number projections that we looked at, um, which comes with its own problems. It sounds like you're like, ha you're complaining about success, but it's, it means like a lot more like payroll's really big and trying to run that kind of stuff is hard. So how has your personal role then changed? Like where, where have you ended up in inside the organization now that things have kind of started to uh, work themselves out? Um, so I'm until uh, the fall, I was still root setting and I'm still coaching the uh, youth competitive team. Um, I've kind of just gone into a, like where I try to figure out a job and then write out what it is and then as soon as I'm comfortable uh, with what is expected of that position, then I try to uh, figure out, like hire it out and figure out who's the right person for that job and then move on. So at this moment, exactly, I'm doing, I'm like the marketing manager and the social media manager and um, the program director and the like administrator, I guess, like payroll and all of that uh, the back end stuff for that stuff and uh, yeah, kind of just anything that comes up. Um, luckily we've had like incredible, an incredible staff team that um, like we have an incredible head coach and an incredible head root setter and we've been able to hire like really trustworthy people to take on like head instructor and like the safety side and the front desk manager um, and like all of those things, all of those jobs now have people running them who I trust implicitly and they're just so great at it that I feel like I can stop thinking about it and I start trying to figure out like, okay, so what is the program director? I'm going to try and figure out what this job actually is and what we want it to be within ground up and then maybe we can write up a contract and try to hire out for that. and. Um, same thing goes for like, what do we really want out of, and what's our budget for marketing and media? Cause we really didn't plan on having one of those budgets either. And so figuring out what that is and then trying to like, as the business grows, be prepared to create the, the jobs that need are needed to run it. Cool. Uh, so you guys have been up and running for a few years. How has the the Squamish climbing community changed in terms of you know what role the Grand Wall Bouldering Co-op plays in terms of you know how much of the community is climbing compared to before? How has it evolved now that you guys have been open? Uh, I think I think the gym I think any gym that opens just makes more climbers like more people who have thought about getting into it get the opportunity to, um, and I think the like the co-op still plays a really vital role in terms of a space that is a little bit quieter and the the way that it's set is really great for hard climbers and they have a moon board we don't have one of those um and yeah and hopefully like what happens is we just create more and more climbers and that creates more and more um support for both uh the gym and the co-op and i think Squamish is going through a really crazy boom at the moment. Um, like housing prices similar to like Toronto. <laughs> um, and so you're looking at, but it's, it's it's still cheaper than Vancouver. So you're looking at having a lot of people move here really fast and trying to buy up everything before the prices go up even more. Um, so a lot of like outside influx of people and people who are commuting to Vancouver for work or people who are trying to do startups or tech startups and that kind of thing. That's kind of the new influx in Squamish. So the population is just growing faster and faster. Um, and there's a lot of little kids and there's a lot of families moving here. Hmm. Um, so after going through this journey, the business is, you know, by all standards, you know, a success as a gym. There are certainly other girls, other young women 
out there, other young men who are, you know, in that same period of the road tripping and the gravel roads and all that, and thinking that maybe, hey, this is, this is, you know, maybe the story that I want to live. Are there any lessons that you could go and, and give those people now? I think that it's important to figure out your own lessons through it. I think, I don't think I got this before, but no one can actually help you do it, which sounds like horrible. But like you, you, there's so much of it that you're going to learn that no one else will have ever known so much different than anyone else's that uh, I think being naive about what you're going to have to learn is important and being okay with that and being okay with sucking at everything all the time is really important. Uh, I know I sound very inspirational, but uh, that, like, I think, I think that's, you just have to be okay with being new at everything all the time in order to open a business or push yourself in any way, shape or form. I think there's a lot of value in that. I actually, I like that. I think that's, yeah. Yeah. It's maybe not written, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah. yeah. No, it doesn't sound good. I, I totally realized that. I, yeah, I got, yeah, I got asked at like an entrepreneur thing a few weeks ago and everyone else was like, believe in yourself. Uh, like, uh, what up? Blah, 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 blah. and then it got to me and I was like, I think I wouldn't tell my younger self anything because if I had known any of this, there's like a high chance that I would not have wanted to do it, but I'm really glad I did. It's just the fact that you have to go in being like naive and positive enough and like have enough go like have enough gumption to do it. And then like all that stuff that all that like stuff that comes your way while you're doing it, you just kind of have to work through. So you do. Um, but I don't think there's anything that you can tell anyone that will not make them hate you later for saying it. Like, I can't say like, just push through. It's like, if just like do it until it doesn't make sense. Like that's the best advice. If it stops making sense, like get out of there. But if it still makes sense and it's still like, if you still know why you're doing it, whatever reason that is, then keep doing it. Cool. Are you, uh, uh are you still <laughs> riding a unicycle every once in a while? No, actually, um, yeah, I think my dad sold it when I left Ontario and then I, I kind of, and this was like five years ago that I was like, okay, I like, it's been a while, but I want my unicycle back. And I, my parents were like, oh, that old thing, we like gave it away. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> so now I don't unicycle anymore, but um, if I see one on the street, I will totally pick it up and rip it around a bit. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you uh, you taking the time to go through all these questions and, and forcing you to answer a lot of stuff that that's kind of ridiculous. But no. uh, yeah, I you know I love I love this story as somebody that you know I'm not interested in doing a lot of the things you've done because it scares me in certain ways or you know talking about being tied down to a business that's a big turnoff for me. But I yeah. really like that there's somebody out there that like tried it, did it, made a a good success out of it and uh, learned a lot. So I'm glad you could share that with everybody. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sorry. It's yeah, it's always hard to be articulate around uh, these things, but hopefully that was good. <laughs> I had a great time. So I thanks a lot for, for talking to me, Lauren. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. I'll talk to you next time. Maybe I'll see you at Nationals or something like that. Yeah, totally. See you there. All okay. right. Bye. Bye. That's it for this episode of Plastic Weekly. Thanks to Lauren Watson for answering my questions, and thanks to you guys for listening. Plastic Weekly is presented and produced by me, Tyler Norton. If you like this episode, consider donating a dollar or two each week to my Patreon at patreon.com slash plasticweekly, or just leave a rating or review in your podcast app. Ratings are nice, reviews are great, and donations earn you an envelope of stickers. Thanks for all your support. Make sure you visit PlasticWeekly.com to find footnotes, references, and other bonus content related to our episodes, including some charming old photos of Lauren's journey from riding a unicycle in the snow to her parents helping hammer in tea nuts. If you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment at PlasticWeekly.com, and you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can send me an email to Tyler at PlasticWeekly.com with your comments, concerns, questions, compliments. Just tell me you're out there somewhere. Good luck to everyone competing this weekend, including at the U.S. Open Bouldering Nationals and at the Alberta National Series Bouldering event. We'll be thinking about you.
Talk to you next week. 